Is Michael Penix Jr. a first round lock? Are the Seahawks trading out of the 16th pick? How does the Stefan Diggs trade affect the NFL landscape? Chuck and I break down all the latest developments surrounding the NFL draft in today's episode of Whitewater Drafting. Let's light them up. I'm Jackson Bevins. And I'm Chuck Powell. And this is Whitewater Drafting. Welcome back to Whitewater Drafting. I am Jackson Bevins, and I am joined once again by my friend and fellow degenerate Chuck Powell of KJR. <laughs> Chuck, how are you? I'm great. Uh, yeah, I really think that if we we need to do the life preservers, though, I think that's a <laughs> yeah. really good touch. Since this is on video, we just wear life preservers uh, on the show. Maybe I'll just right before just like uh, go in the shower and wet my hair, uh, like we just came off the rapids. Uh, I love breaking it. down the draft. Uh, just something to consider. Mike's the big picture guy here. He knows what visual works. Uh, but uh, just throwing it out there as a possibility. It's called brainstorming, Mike. Any <laughs> idea is a good idea. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, hey, I'll tell you what, man, we might we might need them because the waters are getting choppy. We're we're getting close. Rumors yeah, are heating there. up. And yeah, and we had which some, is the best part. Jackson. It's the best I mean, part, man. I, I mean, I did an entire week on the air this week and every single time we discussed it or every rumor did it, we discussed every every single rumor. Michael Penix's draft value kept going up. <laughs> I mean, I got to uh not to date us uh, since we're doing this podcast but i got to wednesday and i had michael Penix from one expert in the top three and then the very next day just when you think you know uh you figured something out uh, i have somebody on that says yeah i think second round so I, I mean but that's the beauty of it i mean we truly don't know and it gives us this opportunity as degenerates to spend a month trying to figure out what we think is fact and what we think is fiction and, you know, trying to find the gold nuggets through all of that silt, uh, that we dig up from the riverbed. Uh, that's what this draft process is all about. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, that's why we obsess about it for two months leading up and yeah. we just get, we get more and more information or misinformation layered on top of what we already have. And, you know, these days everyone is connected, right? Like when I first started really paying attention to the NFL draft on high school, call it 20 something years ago, you know, you've got Mel Kuyper and it's like, well, this is what Mel Kuyper says or what John Clayton says. And that was the news. <laughs> but now, yeah. you know, players have their own podcasts and GMs are going on podcasts and you know, there's 12,000 credentialed media members or whatever at the combine that are each, you know, saying their thing. And you got, players and teams with their Twitter accounts and, and all that stuff. And so there's so much more to chew on and, uh, and it's, it's really the fun part of it. And, you know, yeah. you mentioned Michael Penix. That's one of the things we're going to talk about today is just how crazy his stock has been even in the last week, since the last time you and I talked, but before we get into it, I do want to remind everyone listening that whitewater drafted is proud to be sponsored by Seattle cigar concierge and Balvenie single malt scotch whiskey. Two of my favorite companies out there. Extremely happy to have both of you guys on board for this. Uh, you know, Chuck. Before we, you get into Penix, though, I, oh, I yeah. do want to say because we have to tip our cap to the man, Mel Kuyper Jr. And you uh, both are probably too young to even realize this. But when he got this thing started, I, I, I mean, this is this shows you that you've got draft Nick nature in your blood. When he got this whole thing started, and he gets the credit for it. Um, you're like everybody's reaction to it nationally. Football people was who is this fool, <laughs> and why does his opinion matter? But me, my reaction as a kid was, oh my gosh, this draft thing is the coolest thing yeah. ever. Uh, I can't wait to learn more. Mel Kuyper's awesome, um, and now it's a full time job for him, paying millions of dollars a year to him. And I and mark my word, uh, someday he will be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mel Kuyper Jr. will be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I just had to mention that during one Whitewater drafting episode. Tip of the cap. I don't think he's the best at it anymore, but he was the the man that yeah. got the hype and the hysteria started. So kudos to Mel. Uh, I can't say good enough things about the guy. Yeah, no question. He's he, the Bob Cousy of the <laughs> NFL draft. 
<laughs> no, for real though. Like I'm, I'm glad yeah. you did because it's, it's easy to just keep moving forward without acknowledging how this draft mania came to be. And, and you're yeah. right. Mel Kuyper deserves all the flowers for that because it has become a massive cottage industry, billions of dollars. I mean, you've, you've got stuff that comes out of draft coverage that moves Vegas lines right? And millions of dollars follow in sports bets mm -hmm. based on new reports and, and all of that stuff. So I'm glad Hundreds you Hundreds of thousands of people yeah. show up at the event now, which they bounce around from city to city to give them a chance to host it. So cool. And they treat it like a rock concert to watch 21-year-old football players walk on a stage and hug a redhead. <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> And yet hundreds of thousands of people are showing up to witness this. I mean, first of all, it just shows you how big football is. Yeah. It shows you how big college and pro football are. And this is not only like Christmas, which I compare it to a lot because of the buildup. It's also like the best wedding you've ever been to because people on both sides of the aisle meet up. And this is where college football and the NFL converge. Uh, so this, it's just... Uh, it's mind blowing um, what it's become, and I'll tell anybody that'll listen. It's the most single most talked about sporting event in America in the calendar year. Yep. Uh, uh, considering how much time we spend uh, evaluating this process, but we've now here in the month of April. Now we reach the pinnacle, and now this is where you think about it every day and talk about it every day. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that this is the time where you can really start to put more stock into what you hear. The play clock is winding down. You know, there's only so much more motion you can run. But it's funny, you know, you talked about the draft as a live event, and and I'm happy you brought it up because I remember, you know, my my niece when she's nine now, so maybe around the time she was five or six, you know, she'd be watching uh, YouTube on her mom's uh, laptop or, or tablet, and the videos that she loved, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is the dumbest thing in the world. But she would watch kids open toys. Like that's, that's what it was. There would be a kid and whatever the new toys were that came out, new Bratz doll or whatever, they would open it. And it was the unboxing that she loved. I mean, and they're getting yeah. millions of views on these videos. And then I was like, holy shit, that's just the NFL draft. <laughs> that's all we're Pretty doing. <laughs> we're gathering Pretty around much. to watch our team unwrap, you know, the new present. That's why I stopped short of saying, come on, you got to find some kind of better activity because then I have, I have to look in the mirror. That's right. We don't want to do come that. Come on, nine-year-old, let's go. You got better things to do. Get outside and play. Nope. Uh, right. I'm going to watch you unwrap this gift right now yeah, because that's yeah. what I do every April. Well, and you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, man, the draft is, is one part of the present opening process, uh, but the offseason is full of them. And one of the things you and I talked about in our first episode was how quick fans are to grade a team's offseason as early as the first wave of free agency. And that's something that we both pushed back on a bit. Back then, I said there were still so many more moves coming, and it's best to reserve judgment. But the trade that went down this week surprised even me. You had the Houston Texans who surprised everybody last year. I mean, when they traded this year's first to the Cardinals in last year's draft, we were like, Cardinals are going to have two of the top three picks. In, in the NFL draft in 2024, Texans go out, win the division, win a playoff game, and then traded for all pro Stephon Diggs, wide receiver from Buffalo. They gave up a, a second round pick next year from the Vikings that they got in their earlier trade this offseason, and they received Stephon Diggs, a fifth and a sixth. Chuck, talk to me. You were on the air when this broke. Mm -hmm. what, what was the initial reaction? Well, I think, well, the initial reaction is... That's all you got. That's the that was like the initial reaction. That's all Stefan Diggs is worth is a second round pick, and you had to throw in some draft capital as well. But the more you think about, or at least the more I think about it, and the more I step back from it, I I think what's very clear here is that the Buffalo Bills had a Stefan Diggs issue. Mm -hmm. They felt that it was affecting their true face of the franchise, Josh Allen. Um, there is a distrust in today's game of guys who seem to be even slightly on decline at the age of 30. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephon Diggs has not had a 100-yard receiving game since week six of the regular season. Mm -hmm. So that's a player that undoubtedly is in decline, but I still think he's in a window to be a 
Pro Bowl caliber wide receiver, which Houston can benefit from. But from the Buffalo perspective, which had everybody shaking their heads or scratching their heads uh, or whatever you wanted to do to your head uh, at that given moment, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear that, hey, if we wait another year, that's another year's worth of damage that somebody with some diva traits could bring to the organization, could bring to Josh. Um, I remember when Minnesota got rid of him and people thought it was a mistake and they immediately replaced him with this guy named Justin Jefferson. Yeah, I heard he's uh, okay. Who ended up being a pretty good pick like right out of the shoot, right? Maybe even improved the position from the jump. I don't think Buffalo's got a chance to do that because of where they, they pick in the draft. But just starting from the Buffalo perspective, even though like on the surface it feels like Stefan Diggs should be worth more than that, they got rid of a contract of a guy that they were – four more years of Stefan Diggs. Obviously, there was an issue. Otherwise, you don't take a $31 million cap hit as well uh, in order to make the trade. Uh, and I think that that was just them realizing this is not a part of our future. Let's find the pieces that are – uh, and let's build around Josh Allen. And if he's as great as they think he is, and a lot of us think that he is, I mean, Brett Favre lost Sterling Sharp and didn't miss a beat. He was just That's as right. good, maybe better uh, afterwards. Uh, everybody thought that uh, Mark Duper and Mark Clayton were the secret to Dan Marino's success. Uh, no, uh, they were terrible without Dan Marino, and he just kept putting up 5,000-yard seasons. So if he's as great as they think he is, uh, th they'll find some weapons to put around him I think that this was cutting our losses on Stephon Diggs. And so it actually, believe it or not, Jackson, now that I've kind of run through the entire process, sure. I think it does make sense for Buffalo, but there's the Houston side as well. Well, let's, yeah, let's stick with Buffalo here for just a second, because for the last four years, the AFC has kind of been at the beginning of the season, you're looking, all right, who's most likely to come out of this conference it's been a three, sometimes four team conversation. You know, the Chiefs, the Bengals, the Ravens in and out, and then the Bills were just locked in. This is going to be one of the three best teams in the conference. And, and they have been consistently have been that the last four years. Even if they take a wide receiver in the first round, say it's Brian Thomas or Xavier Worthy or Adonai Mitchell, someone along those lines, does this take the Bills out of the top three, top four echelon in the AFC for you? Uh, you know, what's funny about that is I'm, I'm going to say no. And, and, and I think the initial reaction is yes, but again, more you think about it, I'm going to go ahead and say no to that because I mean, even Vegas, unless I heard misinformation, um, uh, today Vegas, the line in Vegas did not change for the Buffalo Bills future. The over under didn't change, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I was listening to the wrong person. Maybe I haven't done enough research on this, but um, from what I was hearing, the line didn't change on their over-under. Their chances of winning the AFC East didn't really get adjusted. Um, and and I think that that might speak to sort of this understanding that Stefan Diggs is very good, maybe even touched upon greatness, um, but maybe he's not there anymore. Uh, so... Do I put them on the top line anymore like I have the last few seasons? You know, maybe I don't think that they're the biggest threat to the Kansas City Chiefs dynasty this upcoming season, but I don't know if I would have put them there with Diggs. Fair. So I'm going to say I, I like them as much as I would prior to this trade. And I know that sounds strange. You lose a, lose a player like that. But I do, I do sort of think that he was a little bit on decline, and I think if they're smart, they can find ways to replace him. Well, yeah, speaking to the odds, uh, I just pulled up the most recent ones. And as of right now, they are tied for the third best odds to win the Super Bowl among AFC teams. There you yeah. go. The Chiefs are in first, Ravens are next, and then they are tied with the Texans and the Bengals at plus 14. So it sounds like the Texans the may Bowl. have come up because the Texans of the Texans definitely came up. But yes. But the Bills didn't go down. At least they didn't go down that much in the eyes of the futures yeah well and and the biggest line mover were, was cj stroud's mvp odds and because this uh, is a guy that was getting talk as a rookie and now he's got that year under his belt and even if stefan diggs is not all caps stefan diggs anymore 
I mean, he could be the third option in that passing offense. You know, that's that's how good they are. So, yeah, I think we see more movement from the Texans than we do with the Bills. And 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 just to put a cap on the Bills side of things, you know, yes, Stephon Diggs' production absolutely cratered second half of the season. It coincided with their switch in offensive coordinator from Ken Dorsey to Joe Brady. And mm-hmm. the thing with Joe Brady is he doesn't draw up plays for specific players there's no we need to make sure our best player gets the ball in his hands x amount of times uh when he was offensive coordinator at carolina dj moore was third in receptions on that team behind oh my gosh i can't even remember who the jabronis were that had more catches than him that (laughs) year and so that's what you saw with stefan diggs the bills kept winning games lavisca chenault might have been one of them and i don't think terrace marshall was there yet but i think lavisca chenault and one one other player new seahawk so yeah somebody somebody is screaming at at their phone right now with the name of the guy i'm i'm forgetting but uh (laughs) you know that's that's joe brady's thing here's the deal the bills kept winning games after the switch, I think they lost one regular season game uh, with that switch. So I think a lot of, you know, it, it doesn't take much, it seems, to get Diggs agitated. And the fact that he went from 85 receiving yards a game to 47 with that switch was enough to agitate him. But I don't think it hurt the Bills overall. And I don't think this trade hurts mm-hmm. them that much because they likely will draft a, a highly thought of uh rookie wide receiver a lot of talk about them looking to trade up now you know um i think they could even trade for another wide receiver think about if you added a iuk and you still get him and you well higgins is already making his big money iuk's not quite there if for the year while you're eating the dead cap money from Diggs, you bring in iuk and then you slap franchise tag on him if you have to after the season's over or you work out a long-term deal I, I think Brandon Ayuk as a number one receiver with Josh Allen could be oh could put up some scary numbers. Yeah, get I mean, him out of the division, of, man. I'd be yeah, fine get, with get that. him out of the division. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I I do wonder if that's something that Buffalo entertains. That well, we'll you know we're in it. If we think we're in a championship window, we'll sacrifice some draft capital. We've got to fix our cap space going forward because it was a mess. Think about all the guys that they had to cut this year, Morse and Poyer and all of those. That's right. So we we what if we could add an IU, sacrifice some draft capital, and get a number one wide receiver on a really small contract that we can work on him being Josh Allen's go to guy for the future. I think that's maybe a creative way to not fall off at that position. Well, I think there's a tremendous amount of skill set overlap with Diggs and Ayuk too. Ayuk, mm-hmm. actually, that's my favorite comp for Brandon Ayuk is uh, late stage Minnesota Vikings, Stephon Diggs, someone that just wins at every level. Incredible. I mean, the thing about Ayuk is his release game is insane. It's like watching an and one mixtape. The guy's ability to separate from coverage within the first two steps of his route is is unbelievable. So yeah, Diggs a lot, physicality. A lot of options for Buffalo. Yeah. From the Texan side, do you like this move philosophically? Yes. And and I know everything I just said about Buffalo, where I say it makes sense, but it also makes sense from the Houston perspective. You got an up-and-coming quarterback. You're going to get Stephon Diggs in his best attitude that he's going to have. So he's going to a new team. For the first time in 10 years, I'm not going to play in frigid cold weather. Uh, I get to go down to Houston. I get to be the veteran in the group. That probably could use it. Tank Dell, Nico Collins could use an experienced, you know, stat compiler like Stephon Diggs to show him the ropes because he's a very good, very accomplished receiver. Um, it might be the perfect ingredient for them, and they're going to get him with the best attitude possible. So, to me, um, even though I don't think Buffalo falls off that much from losing him, I do think Houston benefits considerably uh, from having him. And look, he got, I mean, he got tired of Minnesota and he got tired of Buffalo and he'll get tired of Houston eventually yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, but y- you get him in the first couple of years and I think that's all you're really looking for. And then you can let him go and not really suffer too much of a financial blow because Buffalo's already taken that on uh, by moving him. And so you get the opportunity to just add him to an up and coming team and he could be a really nice, I don't know if it's a finishing piece, but a really nice piece to put them in that equation of one of the best teams in the AFC. Well, they chopped the last three years off that contract too. So he'll be a free agent after this season. 
did, did oh, they, they completely okay, chopped I'm, it off. I'm I'm curious about it. my my understanding was that it's team it's team options up to three more years after this that Houston is in position to essentially activate each next year of the contract or let him yeah. go to free agency. Yeah, I mean they take the dead cap. So Buffalo took off the plate that they can't get out of it without a cap hit, which another great benefit for Houston, as I understand it. And you might be right, Mike, but I think it by them taking the cap hit, Buffalo, then that frees them to either keep him or just decide, well, since we don't have a cap hit, we can cut him without any consequence. Yeah. No, I think I, I think, think this puts them in a great that maybe position. Maybe not. Yeah. I, I, obviously, I didn't go, you know, uh, Joel Corey. Uh, on uh, <laughs> yeah. Stefan Diggs this week, um, but uh, so maybe maybe Mike's right. But um, either way, it doesn't really matter, Jackson. Uh, I think it's a really nice improvement to the Houston Texans right now. Well, and and one of the things that I think, if you're gonna do the young quarterback, everyone's saying, "Oh, get the young quarterback, get the quarterback on the rookie contract." Well, that's that's great. You you want that player to be able to elevate the franchise. We've seen C.J. Stroud show the ability to do that. But you also you can't just say all right, quarterback, fix our team. You got to put them in a position to really do that. And they they have done that. They they struck gold with a couple of late picks. Well, Tank Dell's third rounder, Nico Collins was a late pick. I don't remember exactly where, but a day three pick. And those guys have, have turned into monsters early on in their careers. But, you know, it's interesting. We're starting to see some of these teams do this. And, and now two franchises who seem poised to really flip their uh, fortunes in a very short period of time have the Carolina Panthers to thank for this. You've got the Chicago Bears <laughs> and the Houston Texans. Their rebuilds are in hyperdrive because of the lack of a better word incompetence of the Carolina Panthers taking Bryce Young, which allowed the Texans to get C.J. Stroud, and then, of course, trading what became the number one overall pick and their best offensive player in D.J. Moore uh, to the Bears uh, for the right to draft Bryce Young. So you've got that going, but also you're seeing it in Tennessee. You know, if Will Levis is going to be the guy, you're not going to find that out with him throwing to Nick westbrook Akine. So you bring in... Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, and now uh, they went out and they paid a ton of money for Calvin Ridley. Yeah. You know, these are teams that are, I, I appreciate it, you know? The Bears are building this unbelievable landing spot for presumably Caleb Williams by having DJ Moore and bringing in DeAndre Swift and then trading for Keenan Allen. I mean, that to me is how you do it. You know, and you brought up Tennessee. I just had this thought today. Everybody in the draft has them taken the tackle alt Uh, at number seven that'll be the first tackle off the board I mean keep in mind who they hired and that is Brian Callahan who was the offensive uh, coordinator with the Cincinnati Bengals what did the Bengals do when they had the opportunity uh, in the draft already with T Higgins in the fold Mm -hmm. maybe their number one receiver of the future Mm -hmm. did they take the tackle to protect protect Joe Burrow or did they go for uh, the stud wide receiver Uh, to add to Joe Burrow's weapons. So everybody right now is mocking Joe Alt to Tennessee. Don't sleep on Roma Dunze to Tennessee to add to that equation. No, I I love this. I I actually wouldn't mind playing this out a little bit because I think Harbaugh is going to take the first offensive tackle if he doesn't trade out of five. I think that he's going to draft Joe Alt. He's trading out of five. He's trading out of five. I think that's the most likely thing. Uh, So, yeah, I mean – Tennessee is is a major linchpin in this draft. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, uh, circling back to the actual draft, you know, the, the pre-draft QB landscape continues to shift. The consensus opinion is settling around there being four quarterbacks going in the top five picks, maybe the top four picks. But behind them, there is one quarterback that is getting <laughs> steamed up like crazy since this pro day. Uh, in fact, just this morning, Ian Rappaport referred to Michael Penix Jr. as a pretty likely first round pick and then immediately followed that up by saying he was likely to go in the top 15. Rappaport, of course, incredibly connected uh, and plugged in with NFL decision makers. Chuck, how likely do you think it is that Penix gets taken in the top half of the first round? 
Well, you know, I love doing this draft stuff. Um, I'm just, uh, I am, I consider myself a student of it. I try to absorb information. I try to, I feel like I've gained some wisdom over the years trying to read the tea leaves and even evaluating talent. But I mm -hmm. certainly am not on uh, whitewater drafting or on KJR to try to come off as, you know, a future GM of the National Football League. Right. There, there's certainly stuff that I don't see and I don't know. But but you're talking to someone about Penix. I think our first episode was about me saying, why is there such a gap between him and Jaden Daniels? Yep. And we spent a considerable amount of time on that. So you 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 if you're talking about does is has Penix been undervalued in this process? Well, you're preaching to the choir at Michael Penix Jr. Church uh, yeah. because because that to me. Uh, has should have been the case from the outset. I, I, I haven't ever confused him, compared him to Caleb Williams, and never made an argument for him being the number one pick or even the number two pick. But the idea, this is where I will st stand firm on it, the idea that so many quarterback needs exist in the top 14 picks in this draft, and I'll, I'll, I'll even cut it short at 13, the idea that the Raiders, with their quarterback situation, aren't emerging from this with Michael Penix Jr. or uh, or a quarterback, one of these six quarterbacks that are universally seen now, finally, as first-round values. I've just never felt, even when they, people were saying he's a mid-second rounder, I've just never felt he was going to get past the Raiders at 13. So I, I feel like uh, maybe I was a little bit ahead of the trend on this one. Yeah, you know, and it's it is so so funny with what you're talking about. You know, you said you you, you spoke with someone or, or saw someone predict Penix going in the top three overall, someone else in the second round. Yeah. I was I was talking with someone who's uh incredibly well connected, uh, who was saying that when he was at the combine, he was talking with someone who was speaking with resolution that Penix was going to go in the fourth round. And so it just speaks to how big of a gap there is, but it's also, it only takes one. And there is so much pressure on these teams now to get the quarterback. If you don't have the guy, you have to go get the guy or else your fans don't take you seriously. And I mean, look at it in Seattle. Seattle has a pretty good quarterback and there's still a very vocal, large contingent of fans who are like, you got to get somebody better. So when you're the Raiders and you've got Aiden O'Connell and Garden Minshew, mm -hmm. that's that's not going to work, especially if you only got a year or two left of Devontae Adams, who's your best player. So, uh, yeah, I I think that 13 is the lowest Penix goes. I agree. Which, which is crazy because I think that there was a lot of hope with some of these teams that, okay, we can go for another player, another position in need in the first round, and then we'll use our second round pick on a Michael Penix or a Bo Nix. But – I don't think that's going to be the case anymore, and I'm not sure Bo Nix makes it past Denver. Uh, I'm I'm with you. Uh, I've had, this is the way I felt the entire time. I've had uh, the Raiders trading up to get Penix, uh, and Bo Nix going to the Denver Broncos at number twelve. I mean, that's you know I I put a mock together at the beginning of the process. Certainly open to changing it at any time, but I've I've felt that way the entire time, and so I certainly feel more resolute now that we're getting more of this information. Now that Greg Cosell's telling us that his top three quarterbacks, Penix and Nix and Caleb Williams, and Greg wow. Cosell knows a thing about uh, football. He's he's very good at evaluating stuff. So does Hugh Millen, our own Hugh Millen over there at, at KJR. I don't know if there's many people whose uh, evaluation of quarterbacks I trust more. And he's comparing him on our airwaves to Troy Aikman, for goodness sake. Wow. Uh, and that speaks, uh, and I'm talking about Michael Penix, that speaks to the criticism of, well, you know, when you flush him out of the pocket, he's not all that accurate of a quarterback. Well, there are some guys that just are so mechanical. And I think Michael Penix kind of rates in this. This is somebody that doesn't run a lot, even though he's next to Caleb Williams, might be the best athlete of, the, of all the quarterbacks, and yet he doesn't run that much. He runs when he has to run, and I think that's just the way he wants to do things. Uh, but he, but Hughes comparing him to Troy Aikman, for goodness sake, Jackson, and that's a Hall of Famer that won three Super Bowls. And it, it, he's comparing him because that's the way Aikman was. He was so mechanical. He was perfect in, his, in the pocket, and he had demanded perfection from everybody else. And if everybody was perfect, he would be perfect. And that's and, and accuracy. I mean, Aikman, the famous stories of the ball never hit the ground in practice. Right. Uh, but you flush him out of the pocket, and Troy Aikman became average to below average pretty fast mm -hmm. uh, as a quarterback. So 
the knocks against Penix, you know, and his inaccuracy when he's taken outside of the play. Okay, there are some people that are great at that. John Elway, Patrick Mahomes, maybe Caleb Williams is great at that. Uh, but there have been a lot of quarterbacks that have succeeded in the pocket and might not have been that great when flushed from the pocket. Including uh, the greatest and- of all time. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, so, Tom, neither Tom Brady or Peyton Manning were winning games outside of the pocket. Yeah, so sure, list it as a concern, list it as a weakness if you want. But we've got way too many examples. You just brought up maybe the two best ones uh, of guys that, hey, you run your route, you block that guy, and I will complete the pass, and I will move us down the field for a touchdown. So I, I, I don't. I've never understood why people haven't liked him, especially when the medicals came back uh, looking better. And and I do expect uh, him to go not just in the top 13. I think when this process is over, somebody's moving up to get Michael Penix in the top 10. Well, and, and you know, speaking of a team that's in the top 10, I think we've got a perfect microcosm of the value of a really good pocket quarterback because the Atlanta Falcons could have stayed at number eight and taken a Michael Penix or moved up for a JJ McCarthy or a Drake may or a whomever, but they went out and paid $40 million a year for Kirk cousins, who is not going to beat anybody outside of the pocket, but like Michael Penix can stand in and deliver the ball with anticipation and precision at all three levels. I think that is the highlight of Michael Penix's profile as a quarterback and, and, you know, I think and run lot- when it's smart to run, like Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes runs when it's smart to run. That's right. That's right. And and the thing is, and, and Penix showed out athletically at his pro day. You know, ran a four or five, jumped almost thirty seven inches. I mean, these these are really athletic numbers. A nine point seven on the relative athletic scale, meaning he was a top three athlete ever at the position uh, when it comes to the different combine and pro day drills that they do. So. Yeah, he's not short on athleticism. He's got gigantic hands. He's tall enough. He's heavy enough. He checks all of those boxes. The age, the injury history, I get it. 10 out of 10 leadership, exactly. And not, and and I'm going to mention a name here, and, and we mentioned him earlier. And and I want to encourage people who are listening, or, or if Mike ends up chopping this into a clip that makes its rounds on Twitter, don't hear what I'm not saying. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when I make this comparison, I am not making a prediction. But... Michael Penix's profile, granted a couple years older, reminds me so much of C.J. Stroud's. When C.J. Stroud was at Ohio State, great offensive line and a bevy of great receivers. Same thing with Michael Penix. And C.J. Stroud put up a game against Georgia in the national championship game that is maybe until Penix's game against Texas in the college football playoff was the best single game performance in high stakes I'd seen from a college quarterback ever. And CJ Stroud was viewed as an immobile quarterback, a guy that can beat you from the pocket. Sure. But he's got great receivers and great protection. How's that going to go for, you know, the, at the NFL level and that game, he was darting around everywhere. He had to show his athleticism because it was the first time that his offensive line was getting whipped up front. And I think that with Penix, That is their form. Now, is he going to go in and be C.J. Stroud and be a top five MVP candidate as a rookie? No, I'm not predicting that. I'm saying stylistically and from a college profile, draft profile perspective, I think there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, Uh, I think it's a pretty good call, and and I love C.J. Stroud last year. That's the guy I thought should have gone number one. Mm -hmm. I got plenty of documentation on that, and, and, and I was wanting the Seahawks to move up when the year they had the draft capital, the excess draft capital, and to get him. Uh, yeah. And they didn't do that. So right. I don't like Michael Penix quite as much. Um, I think sure. maybe age has a little bit to do with it. But I think that's a that's a pretty decent comparison. And just speaking to something that you said earlier, just off the cuff, um, until you have that quarterback of now and into the future, there's nothing more important as an organization. It's true. You, you have to find that guy. So even the Seahawks, you know, uh, I expect them to trade down from 16 and – uh, and uh, accrue more draft capital. But if they saw, if if Michael Penix happened to fall to 16 and they saw an opportunity to upgrade their quarterback room, maybe not for this year, but for the future, I mean, that's something that I think that they absolutely have to consider. And I, and, and for all of those Husky slash Seahawk fans that uh, want this to happen, 
if by chance, if by miracle, uh, that the, that he was sitting on the board for the Seahawks at 16 and they decided not to take him, and I'm going to categorize that as, as a mistake because, mm-hmm. yes, I understand you have other needs, but until you've identified not just your quarterback for now but the guy that's going to be your organizational quarterback for the future, then you've got work to do to shore that up. Um, mm-hmm. So – um, so I, yeah, long story short, I, I, I've all, I, I think that he's been undervalued this entire time and it feels like finally Jackson, that he is being mentioned where he needs to be mentioned in this draft process. Yeah, man, it, it's going to be fast. I don't anticipate it happening, but it will be fascinating if the Seahawks are on the clock and Michael Penix is still on the board. One, I think that's going to elevate the value of the 16th pick and maybe the trade back opportunities become just too rich to ignore. But I would be at peace with Penix at 16 really quickly after the pick. If it were to go that way, I don't think it's going to be an option and I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade up for him. If I was Seattle right now, I, I don't think, even think they can. I, that's exactly it. I mean, now you're dipping into future draft classes right. in order to do it, and I'm I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. But I mean, yeah, it's going to be really, really fascinating. We'll talk a little bit more in a second about who, what we think Seattle will do at 16, what we want them to do at 16. But last week, you know, we looked at one of the real strengths of this draft class with the offensive line, and today we're going to stay in the trenches with focus on another area of need for Seattle, and that's the defensive line. This is a year where the top guys up front are likely to be pushed down further than normal, given the strength and the depth at the top of the QB class, the wide receiver class, the offensive tackle class. To me, this feels like like normally you're seeing the top two pass rushers in a given draft go in the top 10. And I don't think that's going to happen this year. We might see one in the top 10, maybe. But I think picks 11 through 25 is where we're going to see a lot of lottery talent uh, lottery quality talent at defensive line go later than they normally would. Yeah, I agree with that entirely, and that's going to be an in, that's going to be another interesting uh, decision for John if he's got. And this is a potential to happen. Sixteenth pick overall in the draft. There's a chance here that we're talking about six quarterbacks being taken before that, four receivers, a tight end, three or four tackles. I mean, there's a chance that I think, I, I, look, I think a defensive player or two will come off the board before 16, but probably no more than two. When When's the last time that the team of the 16th pick had a shot at the third best defensive player in the draft? Well, probably and, never. Yeah. And then take that a step further. Just because he's the third defensive player off the board, there's a chance that's John Schneider's favorite defensive player in the entire draft. Absolutely. At number 16. Because I don't think there's a clear-cut consensus, this is the first guy type of thing. There's not a Will Anderson or a Jalen Carter in this draft class. Maybe secretly John Schneider, you know, is, you know... uh, He's got a poster of Jared Verse on his wall, and every you know, every night he walks into his office, <laughs> turns off the lights, pours himself a glass of you know, uh, pours a cab. bath. Yeah, yeah, pours a bath, puts some sprinkles, some flower petals in there. You know, puts on a little Marvin Gaye, uh, and just <laughs> dreams of Jared Verse being a a Seahawk. And then all of a sudden, uh, here he is uh, on the board at 16. He was planning on trading down the entire time, but he has to share with Mike McDonald in a really embarrassing moment. This is the guy that I bathed to. Yeah, I have to take him. <laughs> yeah. I know I told you, but I wasn't expecting him to be here. You know, I mean, there's a chance that his defense defensive player his favorite defensive player in the draft is going to be on the board at 16 because the the expectation that offense and particularly offense on the edge is going to be so dominant in the first 15 picks yeah yeah well let's let's talk about who some of these guys are you mentioned Jared Verse and and for the sake of of this episode and, and trying to create a little bit of delineation you know linebacker slash edge is is a little bit of a fungible position depends on what sort of defense you're running uh we're we're gonna try and include edges in here but there's a couple of players that are you know maybe considered edge rushing linebackers that uh we'll talk about you know when we get to the linebacker group but for the sake of this there, conversation there the are guys- also defensive tackles that are considered defensive ends that's exactly right. Especially right. if you're running a tight three, four. So, yeah, you which know, we're going to exactly, exactly. So, so let's talk about some of these guys that I think are going to most likely 
to get drafted in the first round and and early in day two. You've got Jared Verse from Florida State, who you mentioned. Dallas Turner, who I think right now, you know, if you go to grindingthemocks.com, where they take all the hundreds of mock drafts that are being done by people in the industry, and then they compile them and give you an aggregate. Here's here's where players are going um, out of the last 500 mock drafts. Dallas Turner is the first defense player off the board. Uh, he's from Alabama. You've also got Laatu Latu out of UCLA, a guy that I'm love. Ext- extremely fond of. Extremely fond mm-hmm. of this guy. Uh, you got Jerjon Newton out of Illinois. Byron Murphy out of Texas, another guy I really like. His teammate, Tavondre Sweat, gigantic dude, almost 370 pounds. You got Chris Jenkins from Michigan, uh, who UW fans got way too familiar with during the national title game. And then Braylon Trice. Uh, out of Washington, who was the total game wrecker and and probably the best player on the Huskies defense. Who really stands out to you out of this group? You know, I, I think this conversation starts when it talks about the Seahawks because we run it through the Seahawks filter, and certainly they should be in the market for a defensive lineman. Um, and and because uh, and because of the versatility of today's players and the different scheme looks that almost every organization tries to look, I don't know if anybody's off your board from a positional standpoint. But I'm very curious. I mean, we got to know John and Pete and the kind of player they like to draft, right? Yep. I mean, every year when we got to the cornerbacks, they had to be a certain height. They had to have arms of a certain length. I mean, we knew that was part of the draft process for Pete and John. We also knew that when they lost Michael Bennett, they missed him so much, they spent every year trying to replace him. Yeah, uh, Rasheem Green and LJ Collier. And, oh, they had to find a guy that they could slide to three technique but would be better as a five. And you could even put him out on the edge if you had to. Right. But then they realized, man, this is kind of a fruitless venture. Michael Bennett was a lot better than maybe we even realized. Uh, It's because they never did find him. They never even found that guy. But the point is, they're they're very um, doppelganger-ish, John and Pete. They were always trying to find body types and Mm -hmm. physical Mm -hmm. types that matched the great guys. I mean, even Jordan Brooks was the doppelganger of Bobby Wagner. Oh my god. That's gosh. the way he was spitting described. image as a yeah, as as a prospect. I mean, the spitting image. He had the same linebackers coach in college that Bobby Wagner had. I mean, this is what they've done for years. The most fascinating aspect of this, and we're not going to be able to tell until draft day, the three days of drafts, uh, is how Michael McDonald's going to how he's going to affect all of this and because he runs a different scheme obviously and it's right now the hottest defensive scheme in the national football league he has said recently i want everybody on my defense with the ability to rush the passer i know safety nose tackle i don't care I, i everybody has the ability to rush the passer So when I start to evaluate the process, I mean, for example, Byron Murphy might be my favorite defensive player in this draft. I mean, to me, there's, and I'm not going to say he's Aaron. He's not Aaron Donald. I love Because there's just only one Aaron Donald. But tell me, Jackson, that there's not some Aaron Donald qualities. He's about the exact same size. He's twitchy as hell. Uh, I mean, a defensive tackle, a nose tackle that's twitchy. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, that used to be something we described cornerbacks and wide receivers as being yeah. twitchy. He's a twitchy defensive tackle. He's lean. He's thick. Uh, he's a penetrator. He's explosive. But does he fit this scheme? Does he fit what Mike McDonald is looking for? Because he'd have to play 3-4 in mm-hmm. this system. He's not going to be a nose tackle and a true 3-4. That's for sure. Maybe his teammate, Tavondre Sweat's going to be that, but he's not. So does he even fit the scheme for what the Seahawks – because they have Leonard Williams and they have Draymond Jones. That's a lot of money tied up in guys that really do seem to fit the scheme as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I don't know. I mean, even though he's my favorite defensive player in the entire draft, I'm not sure that Mike McDonald's going to want, uh, a, 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 a four, three defensive tackle in Byron Murphy. Yeah. And that, that's going to be really interesting too, right? Like we're going to have to learn who fits yeah. with Mike McDonald and, and look, it can't get any worse. You know, once, once the NFL sort of figured out, 
the defense that Pete Carroll revolutionized the NFL with, um, he spent five years trying to refigure it out and it never happened. And so, you know, Mike McDonald is on top of, he, he is the defensive scheme Lord in the NFL right now. He's, he's the Sean McVay of defense. And so, yeah, we're going to have to figure out what ingredients he wants to cook with. I Mm -hmm. just, as, as a player, I'm with you. Byron Murphy is way near the top of my list. He's a bit slight. He's under 300 pounds, but man, you use the perfect word to describe him. He is so twitchy. He is, he's the kind of guy that increases your team's blocking sled budget because he's going to hit so hard, so fast. His ability to get his chest into and under the chest of the guy blocking him in that first step is so incredible. And you see a lot of times with defensive linemen, it is a lot of hand fighting. And, and this is where I would contrast him with Latu from UCLA, who's who's probably my next favorite defensive lineman, is Latu wins with his hands. He's It's like watching a, a, a karate fighter where he's got every club in his golf bag in terms of moves to win, whereas Byron Murphy is just going to get lower and into you faster than most guys can block. And so that to me is really attractive because pressure up the middle, even though it's less likely to translate into a sack or a tackle for loss, pressure up the middle does more to disrupt what the offense wants to do than pressure around the edge does. Mm -hmm. And, and Murphy to me is the best interior pressure guy in this draft. Johnny Newton is kind of in the same mold, Mm -hmm. also from the great state of Illinois. And we all know how many great people are from the great state of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, (laughs) Me, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think I think you covered. Have everyone. I mentioned Abraham Lincoln? Yeah, I think. I, anyway, I, obviously, it's a very extensive list of amazing people from the state of Illinois. Yeah, Evan Witherspoon. I mean, I know he's not from Illinois, but he played at Illinois. Uh, so here comes Johnny Newton, and he, and and look, he's he's uh, I think on a lot of boards considered you know right after Murphy in terms of defensive tackles. Very similar profiles. Um, Newton's a pass rush first defensive tackle he's also built that way that lean twitchy kind mm-hmm. of body yep. um Isn't that wild? Some... Think, think about just just go back even 15 years ago and think of the body style of the defensive lineman right these are guys wearing you know size 46 48 pants now these guys got 36 inch waist i mean yeah. six packs it's crazy well, I mean, look at look at the name Chris Jenkins alone. Chris Jenkins, one of the best defensive tackles I've ever seen in his prime from the Carolina Panthers. And he was like 365, and his son, uh, who's in this draft from Michigan, is yep. uh, like 290, 295. Uh, so Unbelievable, even, man. even people named Chris Jenkins look different. <laughs> you know, w- one generation later. But Newton oh, is man. Newton's got a very similar pro- I mean, think, think about how great Michigan was. Think about how many great defensive players are in this draft, Jackson, from Michigan. And the defensive player in the year in the Big Ten was Johnny Newton of Illinois. I know. And so, um, so, but again, is it a scheme fit? Because I think he's more of your traditional, like, three technique, uh, four, three defensive tackle. And that's not the scheme that Mike McDonald's going to run. Uh, but those are the two guys uh, sort of at the at the top of the list. And as I mentioned before, is Tavondre Sweat, even though you wouldn't dare consider a nose tackle at 16, if you move back, is that somebody that is disruptive enough? He's more of your defensive – he's more of your interior guy that you think of, the big ice glacier he's your type Al Woods. that you can't move. That's yeah, right. and he's 366 pounds. Insane. And they're worried that he's going to get bigger. Um, but he can move. He can absolutely move. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, you love Murphy. I love Murphy. I, I love Newton. I don't know how you feel about Newton, but yeah, well, maybe what's, what's not to love? <laughs> he's, yeah. I mean, he's awesome. Maybe, maybe Sweat is the one that they've got circled just because he's a better scheme fit for what the Seahawks are looking for, and they don't have to spend a first-round pick to get him. Well, and that's, and that's just it, too, because, again, this is something that I harp on and something that I know you appreciate as well. We have these, these decisions don't come in a vacuum. There's opportunity cost for every player you pick. There are players that you can't have because you made that pick. So with that in mind, if you knew that the Seahawks were going to draft a defensive lineman in the first round, would you prefer based on their personnel and what we're anticipating from Mike McDonald, 
Would you prefer that it be an interior defensive lineman to go next to Leonard Williams, rotate in with Jaron Reed, or are you looking for someone on the edge? Uh, well, their edges uh, are, you know, now we're thinking about an outside linebacker at yeah. this point. Um, well, I, let, 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 let me propose, let's, let's say, uh, right. let's say all of these guys are, let's say there's no defensive players taken in the first 15 picks and Seattle, yeah. for whatever reason, can't find a trade down partner. They're sticking and picking 16, which of these defensive, I mean, we haven't even talked about Dallas Turner you, hardly you at put, all. You put, you go Turner and then you turn him into a stand up three, four edge. But the thing is, I like what you've, I got, I like, uh, Mafe. Uh, I think he's going to have a breakthrough with yeah. McDonald if he didn't have one already. Uh, and then Nuosu's, you know, obviously they're committed to him, and I like him. So, yeah. but Der you Derek can, Hall you, flashed last year. You can never have enough depth. I mean, anytime you can add a pass rusher, you add a pass rusher. So it feels to me like the biggest need would be to find somebody a little girthier than Jaron Reed at nose tackle, mm -hmm. uh, and yet. If I've got the 16th pick and I'm committed to adding something on my front seven, I'm getting an edge guy. I'm getting another pass rusher. Yeah, and and this comes back to the age-old question about drafting for need or best player available. And look, man, there's I just can't emphasize enough how much change happens, not only in the offseason, but throughout a season. And no matter how deep you think you are at a specific position, chances are you're going to need another guy. And so, yeah, I'm I'm with you. If if Dallas Turner is there, just take Dallas Turner and then figure it out. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I still think they're going to trade down. I, I do I still, too. I do I too. I think that's going to be what they what they do. But we just never know. As I mentioned, that apple of your eye in the draft. We don't know who who's Johns is, and we don't know who Michael McDonald's is going to be. And we are going to see a different draft. Uh, this year, I don't think there's any question about it. I think Mike McDonald's probably going to call out John, like, "Why are you so insistent on finding a six foot three inch cornerback with thirty three inch arms? Where is this coming from?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's like, "Well, you can take Pete Carroll out of the building, but you can't take him out of me." Uh, so, or maybe John's relieved that he doesn't have to look. Hey, for those maybe guys I, I think it's going to take us. I think it's going to take us a couple of years to figure out just yeah. how strong the decoupling was there and and how much there was a natural overlap between John Schneider and Pete Carroll versus them from here and saying, okay, we got to work together. Let's, let's figure out how to blend. And I think that's going to be a really, really fascinating thing. And, and look, we transition in just for the last thing from this episode is talking about what we want Seattle do at 16. We focused on the defensive line here for the last 15, 20 minutes, but opening it back up to all positions at 16 of all the guys that are there. I know when we did this in our first episode, you were saying trade down. Uh, I think just, just today, Chad Forbes tweeted that the worst kept secret in the NFL is that the Eagles Packers and commanders are, uh, negotiating with Seattle for the 16th pick. He called that the worst kept secret in the NFL right mm. now. It is seeming more and more likely that Seattle is going to trade out. And as positions that I think Seattle is less likely to uh, target with the first round pick, keep getting pushed towards the top of this draft. It feels like there's going to be more guys available in the late teens and early twenties that still really fit what Seattle wants to do available than I used to think there were. So let let me ask you this. Okay, you you want them to trade down? That's great. I I am warming up to the idea more and more of trading down. Um, I'm I'm into it. But that's a vacuous thought. Well, sure. Oh, you just trade down. Okay, great. What what are you getting? Would you like to see them, let's just say those are the three teams, the Eagles, the Packers, and uh, the Commanders. I'll, and, and I'm going to pull up uh, who who they've got in, in terms of you know where they'd be trading down to. But is there one of those teams that really stands out to you like, yeah, that's, that's the move I want to make? Not only is there one of those teams, if you remember back in the first episode, we said, let's make our prediction now and we can change it as we go. My prediction was with Washington specifically uh, because they have two high second round picks. And so I'm sticking with that. I haven't 
changed my opinion on that whatsoever. So if that's the question on the table, I'll stick with what my answer has been the last couple of weeks, and that's Washington. You trade completely out of the first round. You get two bites of the apple early in the second, and at that point, I will entertain things that I don't want to entertain in the first round. I don't want to entertain an inside linebacker with the 16th pick in the draft. I don't want to entertain a left guard with the 16th pick in the draft, but if I can get a left, my favorite left guard and my favorite inside linebacker with the two picks that I get from the commanders in the second round for this, you know, trade that, you know, this fictitious trade that we're discussing here. Now, all of a sudden I'm interested in them because I think I can get a day one opening day starter to help me compete right away uh, and fill what I think are the two biggest holes right now, um, you know, depth chart wise on this uh, 2024 roster. What, do, what does that trade look like? What are, what are the commanders giving up uh, to move up to 16? Two, they have two picks. I, I don't have them specifically, the numbers. I think They've one's, got 36 and 40. 36 and 40. So Would you rather 36, have 36 and 40 than number 16? Yep. You would? Yeah, for what they need right now. I mean, normally I don't like doing that, but um, I mean, I'll, I'll sit there and wait. Till draft day, I'll sit. Well, you're going to. You're not. You're not going to pull a trade like that off until you're on the clock. Would you so rather I'll, have? Would you rather have 36 and 40 or 22 and 50? Because that's what the Eagles got. 22 and 50. Um. I well, you know, now that you put it that way, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, 22 and 50. Yeah, that sounds good. How about um, 25 and 41? Well, I'd rather have 22 and 50 than 20, you know, if if that's what I if that's what I've got. Um so okay, if I get make the preference, yeah, I'll take the first rounder six picks later and then pick up the second rounder at number 50, but um I just to me I mean, first of all, you've got to have that team that wants to come up. There's got to be something being dangled there at 16. It's just not so easy. Once quarterbacks come off the board, that lust to trade into the first round becomes less. So you got to find some player that they're identifying. And you know who that player, I think, might be that teams are going to be willing to do this for? And and if your next question to me is going to be, you can't trade out, who are you going to take at 16? I would consider this player for the Seahawks as well. Brock Bowers. Oh my God! If he if Brock Bowers is there, you turn off your phone. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I think Brock Bowers is one of the five best players in this draft. Football players in this draft. Wouldn't you draft nice Brock Bowers and you awesome figure it out. Tight end. Yeah, I mean they were running <laughs> jet sweeps to this dude. This is yeah. Georgia. This is Georgia, loaded with playmakers, full of future NFLers, and they're running jet sweeps and bubble screens to Brock Bowers. He blocks like George Kittle. Like <laughs> Brock, Brock Bowers is one of the best football players in this draft. If he is somehow there at sixteen, I don't think he's getting past the Jets at ten. But if he is somehow there at sixteen. Man, I, I'm turning off my phone. I'm sprinting to the podium. I'm drafting okay. Brock Bowers. Here's what I like, though, going back to the trade down potentials. Here's what I like about going back to 22 as opposed to all the way to 36. You can trade out at 22 and still get an even later first rounder and a second round. Like you can keep rolling that forward. It's a lot harder at 36 to then be like, well, oh, there's there's players that teams are going to give up. Now you're now you're picking up an extra third round if you want to trade back out of there. I just think there's so many more options available to you at 22 uh, that aren't there. Uh, you know, if if you move too far further back than that. No, I, and I hear you, but again, like the practicality of it is, even at 16, there has to be. This is why I brought up Bowers. There has to be that person that a team trading up is like, we got to get up and get him, and we'll give up more draft capital we'll get up more draft value just to get up there because we've identified we got to have this guy and there's no way he's getting to us so you okay let's say you've executed that once at 16 and then you get down to 22 now you got to have another team that identifies Mm -hmm. another a different player that they absolutely will give up extra draft value for to get up into the number 22 spot so I'm not saying that's not possible, that rollover and that you just keep moving down and, and accruing because we've seen a lot of teams do it. Uh, but it's not as easy as no, what 
a lot of just football fans think it is. Well, just get out. No, you got to have the partner and you got to have the right trade. And you have to not have somebody on the board that you really do desire uh, in order to to sacrifice that, uh, to, to move down and, and add picks that you don't know who's going to be on the board at that point. No, it's it, it's true. Uh, I would say, I, and I, I totally agree with you, this is something I push back on regularly is like, oh yeah, yeah, trade down, trade down. Well, you got to find someone willing to give you something to come up to that pick. I think this draft is going to provide those opportunities because you're going to have Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene and Kool-Aid McKinstry, the top, you know, three corners in this class, probably still on the board. At least one of those guys is still going to be on the board. You're going to have Xavier Worthy and or Brian Thomas or Troy Franklin or A.D. Mitchell, you know, or Lad McConkey that are still there for these wide receiver needy teams. I, I do think it's more, I think each pick after the top 15, 15 through 25-ish are going to have more trade back potential than they normally do just given the depth the the talent of the top 40 players in this draft yeah uh yeah uh yeah no doubt and so it, it'll be fun to see how john plays it people just automatically assume that john just is he's going to trade down and he does it a lot i just think john likes to trade on, I do on draft day and because like he player. trades he trades up jackson a lot more than what people realize or give him credit for yep he's made several moves to get he can trade it up to get dk you know into in the, into the second round uh, so still he, insane he was there at 64 man <laughs> thank god so he, he slipped thank god he slipped during the three cone drill <laughs> that was the best slip that's ever happened to seattle <laughs> but yeah so i mean it just he does that a little more frequently so i think he's gonna move i think he's gonna do his thing my guess is it's gonna be a move down and for the very reason that you're talking about because this does seem like a pretty deep draft and 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 they do have a lot of needs this year. Yeah, they got a plug left guard. I think they need a starter there. I think they need a starter uh at inside linebacker uh to go uh to to add to the fold here. Uh but they have a lot of needs beyond that and to get a couple bites of the apple versus the one at 16, I just it just makes way too much sense to me, uh, knowing John's history that uh, that's what's going to happen here. Yeah. All right. Last last thing before we get out of here, let's just say, sake sake conversation here, phone doesn't ring the way you think it's going to ring at 16, and you're not getting offered what you thought you were going to get offered. And let's say we've got four wide receivers off the board and five quarterbacks off the board and three tackles off the board. And you're, you're sitting there and you're looking at <laughs> Latu out of UCLA. Uh, let's say Jared Verse is there. Johnny Newton is there. Okay. Is there a player at 16 that you're like, you know what? That guy's still there, Byron Murphy. Yeah, this, this is the guy I'm going to take if he's still there at 16. And you're not allowing Bowers into this equation? Who am I allowed to? Take I think we're both taking. Would, would you take Bowers if he was there? Yes. Okay, then I'm taking him off the board. <laughs> <laughs> this is such an unfair scenario. Suddenly, <laughs> hey man, you got ten minutes to make this pick. <laughs> uh, all right. So at sixteen, um, I don't even know who's available to me at this point. Well, I'm not doing the guard, and I'm not doing the linebacker. Uh, so. If that's the case, I am going to take my favorite front seven guy. I'm going to take Murphy then, if that's the it. case. I'm going to Let's take Murphy, it. and I'm going to trust. You know, I, I mean, it, it's going to be a remi- it's going to serve as a reminder to Draymond Jones, like, hey, you got to be productive, or you're going to be started to mention with the words cap hit yeah. uh, very quickly here. Yeah. I think obviously they're fully committed to Leonard Williams. Uh, but why not? I'll, I'll go ahead and add them to the mix. Um, obviously I'm not, uh, I mean, they're, they're going to, you're going to give different looks to defenses. He's going to give you depth. He could probably play nose tackle, uh, for a few snaps. Uh, he can play, I think a three, four defensive end. So he can back up both Jones and Williams. And he obviously is going to put heat on those guys. You better perform because we just spent a first round pick on somebody that can replace you. So I'll go ahead and go with him because, I think he is my favorite defensive player in the draft. Yeah, man, there's there's so there's so many good options. I think they're going to be there at 16. I I still think Fautanu from UW is is my number. Okay. I'm going to slide him down to my number two guy that I think will still be there because I think 
Laitu Lato <laughs> the UCLA uh, is is my guy as as poorly as I pronounce his name because I I just think that ability to win both inside the tackle and outside the tackle that he has um, he's my favorite guy but you you are bringing in some severe injury risk with him too he'd be my number one um, Fautanu out of UW would be my number two and, and Murphy would be my number three but I think there's probably f- going to be five or six guys there that they could pick that'd be like yep. Good pick. And we haven't even talked about my favorite defensive player in this draft, which is Quinion Mitchell <laughs> out of Toledo, the cornerback. I don't think they're going to go corner in the first round, no. but I, I think this is a guy that is de- – I mean, I think he's this year's Devin Witherspoon, and him there at 16 <laughs> is just insane, but he's going to be there at 16. Well, Reed Woolen did not have a good year. I know. I mean, it. He, he did not have a good – so no, it's he did not, not the slam dunk – Woolen and Witherspoon etched in Seahawk history for the next five years at, at, at ten year five to ten years at cornerback. So I, I I wouldn't take anything off the table. Uh and until we figure out what a John Schneider Mike McDonald draft looks like, until we kind of start identifying the profile of uh, Mike McDonald has never been a head coach. So until we start identifying the type of guys that he would want, the type of groceries that he would choose. That's right. That's you right. You know, then it's so hypothetical at this point, right? Then and and, and I think John's going to make the ultimate decision, uh, but certainly Mike McDonald's going to color this draft uh, completely with completely different crayons than what Pete Carroll uh, used. So um, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see how how it unfolds because I do find it fascinating. Yeah, that's 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 a great way of putting it, man. We're going to see what kind of what kind of crayons he likes to color with. Yeah, and we're less than three weeks away. Oh, by the way. Crazy man. I am I am so looking forward to the next two, three episodes of this show leading up to this draft because it's gonna be so loud by the time we get to draft week, man. This show on draft week is gonna be crazy. I can't wait. <laughs> uh Mike, fired up. Mike, are you sharing the draft with spirit with me? I mean, is it I running am. through your veins yet? <laughs> it it is. It is. It's it's growing and mutating like some sort of disease that I've contracted from the both of you. <laughs> Mike won't leave me alone with the texts all week, man. I, he's I'm got telling, it. He's he's under he's underselling it right now. So uh, we'll close we'll close with this little story. So now I do the draftness thing on the airwaves. Yeah, and it. Even though I absolutely love it, like 10 out of 10, like 11 out of 10 love the NFL draft. Uh, obviously, what it has become has become so ridiculous, you know, considering what we thought it was going to be. So the draftmas month long thing that I compare it to Christmas is so tongue in cheek. And I hope that anybody listening picks up on that because it is supposed to be like comedic. But there's also some, some truth to it, obviously, some truthful comparisons. But when I started doing this, and there are people that can't stand the draft, right? <laughs> yeah, and they yeah. certainly can't stand the hype. That's okay; they're not listening to us, so you, you I speak know. freely. <laughs> but there, there are people in our industry. There are people in the radio industry. There are people at KJR that can't stand how much hype it gets, and yeah, and and all that sort of thing. I think our guy Greg Bell, who uh, you, Greg. you've had on Cigar Thoughts. Uh, he's our guy. He's our Seahawks insider. We have him on almost every day during the uh, football season. Um, and he does do a really good job covering the draft, but he's one of those guys that eye rolls at <laughs> how big and how much it has to dominate. You know, this is supposed to be his off season, right? And instead, he has to work harder during this month than any other month because of how popular the event has become. That, the, the draft has turned NFL reporting into like tax season for accountants. Yeah. So I've done this draft miss thing and I think it's made him uncomfortable. And I think even like the sacrilege element of it has made it a little uncomfortable in me referring to it as that. Um, and, and so we've been doing this for years and he's kind of loosened up over the last few years. Well, he's been hosting our midday show here for the last week from 10 to 12 following Bucky and I, and I'm driving home on the way from work, going home from work. And he's interviewing Omar Ruiz from NFL network, which is an old buddy of his. And so they have a, you know, 15, 20 minute conversation about the draft. They get done. And he's like, say hello to the uh, family for me. Uh, great to catch up to you. 
You do the same, Greg. Yeah, great catching up with you. Uh, all right, we'll do this again soon. And when you're in town, we have to go out to dinner. That sounds great, Greg. I cannot wait. You pick the restaurant. You're very good at that. All right, Omar. Thanks again. Happy draftman. <laughs> he said, said it. I've <laughs> arrived. He said it. Oh, you indoctrinated him. I'm telling you, it fill, it's the draftman spirit. It fills you up. Uh, you and accepted him. Even uh, even somebody so resistant to its pull, like Greg Bell, uh, suddenly is just yeah. doing it casually to old friends of his, <laughs> wishing them a happy draftmas. The next thing you know, he's going to have a draftmas tree in the corner of his house. He's going to do draftmas caroling from door to door in his uh, neighborhood. Uh, I mean, it's just it's going to overtake you, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, the draftmas spirit fills us all. All right, y'all. That's going to do it for the third episode of Whitewater Drafting. Thank you again to Chuck Powell for his time. And as always, you can find Mike, Chuck, and I on social media. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J-A-C-S-O-N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Chuck is at Chuck Powell KJR. Mike is at Mike Barwin. And the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. And listen to Chuck every weekday morning on KJR Sports Talk Radio 93.3 FM starting at 10 a.m. This episode is brought to you by Balveni Premium Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. I've long been a huge fan of their lineup and we're thrilled to have them on board as a sponsor of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, you see me enjoying a glass of their 14-year Caribbean cask which was finished in rum casts to give it a really smooth vanilla note. It's an excellent bottle, and one of the best things about a great scotch is how well it plays with a good cigar. And speaking of, we do have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a terrific price as a listener of the show. Until recently, you've been able to order your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of what this blend sells for in cigars on the open market. But because of the success of the Cigar Thoughts release, we lowered the price to just $149 and we've decided to keep it there. That's right, only $149 for a bundle of 10. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thoughts cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link on the show page to get these easy to smoke stogies rolled with 13 year aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf, or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram and we'll send you the details directly. And the cigars, they come with a Bovita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fieldgoals.com. And if you're listening on our Spotify or podcast and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. <laughs>